Chapter 1, Number 1 All language learners realize at some point that learning a new language requires more than just learning new words. Beyond the new vocabulary is a new system of grammar that makes order of the new words. Chapter 1, Number 2 An old lion whose teeth and claws were so worn that it was not so easy for him to get food as in his younger days, pretended that he was sick. He took care to let all his neighbors know about it, and then lay down in his cave to wait for visitors. And when they came to offer him their sympathy, he ate them up one by one. The fox came too, but he was very cautious about it. Standing at a safe distance from the cave, he inquired politely after the lion's health. The lion replied that he was very ill indeed, and asked the fox to step in for a moment. But the fox very wisely stayed outside, thanking the lion very kindly for his invitation. I should be glad to do as you ask, he added, but I have noticed that there are many footprints leading into your cave and none coming out. Please tell me how your visitors find their way out again. Take warning from the misfortunes of others. Chapter 1, Number 3 Long, long ago in the province of Tango, there lived on the shore of Japan, in the little fishing village of Mizunoyi, a young fisherman named Urashima Taro. His father had been a fisherman before him, and Urashima greatly outshone his father. For Urashima was the most skillful fisher in all that countryside, and could catch more bonito and tai in a day than his comrades could in a week. But in the little fishing village, more than for being a clever fisher of the sea, he was known for his kind heart. In his whole life, he had never hurt anything, either great or small. And when a boy, his companions always laughed at him, for he would never join with them in teasing animals, but always tried to keep them from this cruel sport. Chapter 1, Number 4 Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. Chapter 1, Number 5 There was nothing so very remarkable in that, nor did Alice think it so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be late. When she thought it over afterwards, it occurred to her that she ought to have wondered at this. But at the time it all seemed quite natural. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to her feet. For it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it and burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it, and fortunately was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out again. Chapter 1, Number 6 whether work should be placed among the causes of happiness or among the causes of unhappiness may perhaps be regarded as a doubtful question. There is certainly much work which is exceedingly irksome, and an excess of work is always very painful. I think, however, 
that provided work is not excessive in amount, even the dullest work is to most people less painful than idleness. Chapter 1, Number 7 There are in work all grades, from mere relief of tedium up to the profoundest delights, according to the nature of the work and the abilities of the worker. Most of the work that most people have to do is not in itself interesting, but even such work has certain great advantages. To begin with, it fills a good many hours of the day without the need of deciding what one will do. Most people, when they are left free to fill their own time according to their own choice, are at a loss to think of anything sufficiently pleasant to be worth doing. And whatever they decide on, they are troubled by the feeling that something else would have been pleasanter. To be able to fill leisure intelligently is the last product of civilization, and at present very few people have reached this level. Chapter 1. Number 8. Moreover, the exercise of choice is in itself tiresome. Except to people with unusual initiative, it is positively agreeable to be told what to do at each hour of the day, provided the orders are not too unpleasant. Most of the idle rich suffer unspeakable boredom as the price of their freedom from drudgery. At times, they may find relief by hunting big game in Africa or by flying round the world, but the number of such sensations is limited, especially after youth is passed. Accordingly, the more intelligent rich men work nearly as hard as if they were poor, while rich women, for the most part, keep themselves busy with innumerable trifles of whose earth-shaking importance they are firmly persuaded. Chapter 2, Number 1 The Sultan Shahariar had a wife whom he loved more than all the world, and his greatest happiness was to surround her with splendor, and to give her the finest dresses and the most beautiful jewels. It was therefore with the deepest shame and sorrow that he accidentally discovered, after several years, that she had deceived him completely. Her whole conduct turned out to have been so bad that he felt himself obliged to carry out the law of the land and order the grand vizier to put her to death. The blow was so heavy that his mind almost gave way, and he said that he was quite sure that at bottom all women were as wicked as the sultana, if you could only find them out, and declared that the fewer the world contained, the better. Chapter 2, Number 2 So every evening he married a fresh wife and had her strangled the following morning before the Grand Vizier, whose duty it was to provide these unhappy brides for the Sultan. The poor man fulfilled his task with reluctance, but there was no escape, and every day saw a girl married and a wife dead. This behavior caused the greatest horror in the town, where nothing was heard but cries and lamentations. In one house was a father weeping for the loss of his daughter, in another a mother worrying about the fate of her child, and instead of the praise that had formerly been showered upon the sultan, the air was now full of curses. Chapter 2, Number 3 Long ago the mice had a general council to consider what measures they could take to outwit their common enemy, the cat. Some said this, and some said that. But at last a young mouse got up and said he had a proposal which he thought would solve the problem. You will all agree, said he, that our chief danger consists in the sly manner in which the enemy approaches us. Now. If we can receive some signal of her approach, we can easily escape from her. I venture, therefore, to propose that a small bell be acquired and attached to the cat by a ribbon round her neck. By this means, 
We will always know when she is about and can easily retire when she is in the neighborhood. This proposal was welcomed with general applause until an old mouse got up and said, That is all very well, but who is it that is going to bell the cat? The mice looked at each other and nobody spoke. Then the old mouse said, It is easy to propose impossible remedies. Chapter 2, Number 4 It is a common saying that thought is free. A man can never be hindered from thinking whatever he chooses, so long as he conceals what he thinks. The working of his mind is limited only by the bounds of his experience and the power of his imagination, but this natural liberty of private thinking is of little value. If he is not permitted to communicate his thoughts to others, it is unsatisfactory and even painful to the thinker himself, and the thoughts themselves are obviously of no value to his neighbors. Moreover, it is extremely difficult to hide thoughts that have much power over the mind. If a man's thinking leads him to call in question ideas and customs which regulate the behavior of those about him, to reject beliefs which they hold, or to see better ways of life than those they follow, it is almost impossible for him, if he is convinced of the truth of his own reasoning, not to reveal by silence, chance words, or general attitude that he is different from them and does not share their opinions. Some would prefer today, just as some like Socrates preferred in the past, to face death rather than conceal their thoughts. Thus, freedom of thought, in any valuable sense, includes freedom of speech. Chapter 2, Number 5 it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be at want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighborhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered as the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. My dear Mr. Bennett, said a lady to him one day. Have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennet replied that he had not. But it is, returned she, for Mrs. Long has just been here, and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennet made no answer. Do you not want to know who has taken it? cried his wife impatiently. You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. This was invitation enough. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long said Netherfields is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, that he came down on Monday in a chase and four to see the place, and was so much delighted with it that he agreed with Mr. Morris immediately that he is to take possession before Michaelmas, and some of his servants are to be in the house by the end of the next week. What is his name? Bingley. Is he married or single? Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune, four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. Chapter 3, Number 1 Speech is such a familiar part of daily life that we rarely pause to consider what it is. It seems as natural to humans as walking, and only less so than breathing. Yet it needs just a moment's reflection to convince us that this naturalness of speech is but an illusion. The process of acquiring speech is, in fact, an utterly different sort of thing from the process of learning to walk. In the case of the latter function, culture 
In other words, the traditional body of social practices is not seriously brought into play. The child is individually equipped by the complex set of factors that we call biological heredity to make all the needed muscular and nervous adjustments that result in walking. Walking is an inherent biological function of man. Chapter 3, Number 2 This is not so with language. It is, of course, true that in a certain sense the individual is predestined to talk, but that is due entirely to the circumstance where he is born, not merely in nature, but into a society that is certain, reasonably certain, to lead him to its traditions. Eliminate society, and there is every reason to believe that he will learn to walk, if indeed he survives at all. But it is just as certain that he will never learn to talk, that is, to communicate ideas according to the traditional system of a particular society. Or, again, remove the newborn individual from his social environment and transplant him into an utterly alien one. He will develop the art of walking in his new environment very much as he would have done in the old. But his speech will be completely different from the speech of his native environment. Walking is an organic, an instinctive function, not, of course, itself an instinct. Speech is a non-instinctive, acquired, cultural